patents, patents, patents. It's all about patents. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well, the, the people, I, I would say. There is no patent. This is... Could you patent the sun? <laughs> Today I want to talk to you about a toolkit. And no, don't worry. This is not some boring toolkit to fix your leaky sink. So look up from your iPhone. This toolkit made your iPhone. I'm talking about the Innovation Policy Toolkit. And the world really needs this toolkit to get researchers and entrepreneurs to invent and build stuff. If we think about innovation and law, most legal scholars think about patents. In a 2003 paper, Dan Burke and Mark Lemley put it like this. Patent law is our primary policy tool to promote innovation. But that's like using only a hammer to fix all the things in your house. To help us unbox this innovation policy toolkit, I'm joined today by Lisa Ouellette, professor at Stanford Law School. She will talk to me about our forthcoming paper in the Yale Law Journal, Innovation Policy Pluralism which is joint work with Daniel Hamill from the University of Chicago. Before jumping into the paper itself, I wanted to find out a little bit more about Lisa. What's her background? What gave her the idea? And what is she trying to accomplish with the paper? Since I was in the neighborhood, I went to see her at her office at Stanford Law School. First wanted to know a little bit more about her background. And you'll see that Lisa is not your typical law professor, but let's hear it from her. So I came to law school uh, after working on my PhD in physics when I realized that the kinds of questions I was most interested in were the bigger picture science policy questions rather than the narrow area I was focused on for my physics work. And I was naturally attracted to patent law because historically that has been the primary field in which legal scholars have thought about issues of science and innovation policy. Experimental physics, guys. She's done the work. She's been in the lab. Did you see the picture with her in the lab? The next thing I wanted to know was how did she come up with the idea for the paper? This is what she had to say. So even though patent law has been historically the primary field in which legal scholars have thought about innovation, there are a lot of areas of law that have an important impact on innovation. And this line of project has started from conversations I had with my co-author, Daniel Hemmel, who's an expert in tax law, about the ways that uh, aspects of the tax system replicate some of the functions of the patent system in ways that patent scholars haven't recognized. The paper develops an original taxonomy for innovation policy, which combines traditional IP rights with non-IP policies. In other words, the paper develops a new vocabulary to talk about this innovation policy toolkit. To simplify this intricate system laid out by the paper, I'm introducing a quick and dirty innovation policy equation. As a disclaimer, this equation is not actually used in the paper, but I think that it will help us to wrap our head around the new taxonomy as we move through the paper. The equation goes like this. Innovation incentives plus allocation mechanisms equal innovation policy. And no, it's not formally an equation, but let's go with this for the moment. As Lisa and Daniel put it, innovation incentives establish the payoff structure for producers of knowledge goods, whereas allocation mechanisms establish the terms under which individuals and firms can gain access to knowledge goods. Put this in plain English, we can rewrite the innovation policy equation as follows. Get people to invent stuff, define who gets to use the new stuff, and this is what innovation policy is all about. If only there was a legal device that would allow us to incentivize people to invent stuff, which would define who gets to use that stuff. Hmm. Wait. There is such a device. It's called a patent. So why do we need to make it so complicated? Why do we need to break up the patent into its different sub-functions and decouple its elements? Yeah, I think that's the, the key theoretical move that we're making in this article. I mean, IP scholars tend to view the incentive that IP provides, the reward it provides to innovators who create a new knowledge good, as necessarily coupled with the way that IP law allocates access to those goods through a series of, of super competitive prices on them. 
And um, in this article, we examine ways in which these two elements are actually distinct. I mean, one can imagine a system in which a government uh, scientist is receiving a grant or fixed salary that doesn't depend on their results, but the resulting innovations are patented by the government. And from the perspective of the innovator, this looks nothing like IP, but from the perspective of the consumer, it's essentially identical. On the other hand, you can imagine a system in which the innovator receives a patent and then the government purchases that patent for uh, the fair market value and places it in the public domain. And so there you have a system that looks much like IP from the innovator's perspective, but completely different from the perspective of the consumer. And recognizing the way these two elements are distinct, I, help, I think helps clarify many of the critiques and, and defenses of IP that scholars have made. So let's open the innovation policy toolbox and look what's inside. We can first draw a line between IP and non-IP tools. On the IP side, we've got patents and other traditional IP rights. On the non-IP side, we've got prices, grant systems, and R&D tax incentives. So that's a lot of words. <laughs> but what do they mean? To help us think through this, let's start with a simple example. Let's imagine there's a space invasion, and humanity is suddenly infected by an alien virus. To counter this virus, we want to incentivize the world's top scientists come up with an antidote. Let's say the cost of developing this alien antidote is $100 million, but the value for humanity is $2 billion. Under the traditional patent system, the scientists and businessmen are motivated to invest time and resources into the development of the drug because they know that once they get patent protection, they can charge monopoly prices and thereby capture the full value of the antidote, in this case, $2 billion. A completely different solution is a price system. Under the price system, the government would set a fixed monetary reward for the person or company which comes up with the alien antidote. And once the drug has been invented, the government then places it in the public domain, meaning that everybody can use it free and clear of any liens. If the government reward is as high as the monopoly rent under the patent system, then the innovators will be indifferent between the two systems. But from the consumer or demand side, the axis looks very different. Such a price system is not just theoretical. Already in the 17th century, the French government awarded prices for certain innovations, such as the first hydraulic turbine. Nancy Gallini and Susan Scotchmer point out in their 2003 paper that the World Bank and the WHO have suggested to increase the use of price systems, in particular for drugs that wouldn't be developed otherwise. But now back to our alien antidote. The third tool in the innovation incentive toolbox are grant systems. Under the grant system, the government would directly invest $100 million into alien drug development. And in fact, this government grant system is quite large in scale. As Daniel and Lisa point out, of the total of $500 billion in R&D spend every year in the US, almost a quarter comes from the government grant system. The last tool in our innovation policy toolbox are R&D tax incentives. So let's say a large pharmaceutical company like Pfizer has a total tax bill of $150 million. So the government could come in and say, look Pfizer, by investing heavily into alien drug discovery, you can lower your tax bill dollar for dollar. So basically, every dollar you spend on R&D will not go through ordinary capex, but it will be deducted directly from your tax bill. Now let's have a closer look at the second part of our innovation policy equation, allocation mechanisms. Lisa and Daniel use the term allocation mechanisms to refer to the terms under which consumers and firms can gain access to knowledge goods. In plain English, allocation mechanisms define who gets to use new stuff. Again, we get two extreme ends of the spectrum. On the one end of the spectrum, we get the traditional close IP system where monopoly pricing applies. At the other end of the spectrum, we get an open access non-IP system where everything is placed in the public domain. In between the two extreme ends of the spectrum, there are middle ground solutions like the one proposed by Ian Iris in their 1999 paper. They've proposed a modified patent regime whereby the exclusive rights to an innovation are held by two parties instead of just one. Now that we have a good grasp on both innovation incentives and allocation mechanisms, the two basic building blocks of the paper, we can get to the really interesting part where Lisa and Daniel start combining tools 
along the innovation policy equation. And again, they propose a new taxonomy for the different combinations of innovation incentives and allocation mechanisms, which they call matching, mixing, and layering. Yeah, I think that um, one of our goals in this paper is to help develop a vocabulary to understand all of the different ways that IP incentives and allocation functions can be combined with the non-IP incentives, including grants and tax incentives and prizes, and the way that um, many knowledge goods are subsidized by the government or, or purchased by the government and allocated on a more open access basis. And that having the vocabulary to, to understand those different combinations helps explain why you might want to combine them in different ways in certain circumstances. I will let Lisa explain what they mean by matching. Matching, on the other hand, is about uh, combining things across the, the innovation allocation divide. So having a IP system for innovation, the patent incentivized researcher, and then the government purchasing that such that it's allocated on an open access basis, or having a purely grant funded researcher so that the innovation is the uh, grant incentive, and then allocating it by having the government patent and license the results. So let me recap this really slowly. So matching involves the pairing of an IP innovation incentive with a non-IP allocation mechanism. This is what this looks like in our innovation policy equation. Or alternatively, it can also mean the pairing of a non-IP innovation incentive with an IP allocation mechanism. So this is what it looks like in our innovation policy equation again. So the first example of a matching combination she gives is the pairing of an IP innovation incentive with a non-IP allocation mechanism. The patent incentivized researcher and then the government purchasing that such that it's allocated on an open access basis. While such direct patent purchases by the government may happen from time to time, the more common way in which we encounter this matching combination in practice is basically by the government purchasing drugs from patent holders or pharmacy companies to which the patent holder has licensed the patent and then giving away these drugs at discounted rates to the public. In their paper, Lisa and Daniel mentioned the UK's NHS system as the prime example of this matching combination. The second matching example that Lisa gives is that of grant-funded research, which is later patented. Or having a purely grant-funded researcher so that the innovation is the uh, grant incentive and then allocating it by having the government patent and license the results. So on the incentive side, we have non-IP innovation incentives. And on the allocation mechanism side, we have IP allocation mechanisms. To some extent, this is exactly what the Bayh Act does. It allows recipients of federal research grants to obtain patents on inventions that were generated using grant-funded research. Now, this is how Lisa describes mixing. So, so mixing is about uh, combining different innovation policies on either side of the innovation um, allocation divide. And so on the innovation side, you might have uh, a scientist who receives both some government grant, but also gets some of the royalties from the uh, patent of, on that work. On the allocation side, it's when you have something that's not allocated purely through the IP system at super competitive prices or purely on an open access basis, like government subsidies on uh, patented goods. So mixing means that we use both IP and non-IP tools on either the innovation incentive side or the allocation mechanism side. From my perspective, the main contribution of this paper is that Lisa and Daniel really try to break apart the monolith that we know as IP law, decoupling its elements and then recombining it. So as you can see, the policy implications of this paper could be quite large. And I ask Lisa what she thinks about this. I think that's right. I mean, the primary goal of this paper is focused on the conversation that IP scholars have had and helping to clarify some of those debates. But I think it does have a lot of implications um, for policymakers and people outside the academy, I mean, most obviously for policymakers focused on understanding the different tools for providing incentives for innovation in a different area. But even for scholar, or for policymakers focused narrowly on patent law, I think it's important to recognize that not all innovation policies and problems need to be addressed through the patent system and that there is a, a separate toolbox. So in the future, when we think about innovation and legal scholarship, 
we don't just consider patent law, but we think about other areas of the law as well. Think about the different tools and start combining them in a meaningful manner, both as, as legal scholars and as policymakers. I will put links to all the papers in the show notes below. So if you're interested, you can read up on it. If you like this episode and you want to learn more about law and economics in the future, why don't you show me some love and smash the subscribe button below. See you soon. 